Hi everyone, this is Dr. Mondel. Welcome to English 314, Module 4, Lecture 4. Additional key terms and context for the yellow wallpaper. Things you'll need as you watch this video are first of all your copy of the Bedford Cultural Edition of the Yellow Wallpaper, that's the book uh, edited by Dale M. Bauer that we're using that has the short story and the various contextual pieces. And you might want to reference your course syllabus, uh, which you can access on Blackboard by clicking on the syllabus link in the left-hand menu of our course page. And that syllabus document is just handy to see the page numbers of the different readings in case you want to flip back and forth uh, as you're watching the video. So the agenda for today, first of all, welcome back. We talked in the last lecture about some of the historical context that is relevant to the yellow wallpaper. I also referenced briefly a little bit of author biographical information, some information about Gilman herself uh, that I thought was relevant to kind of understanding the story and the scope of the story. Um, you have, since watching that initial lecture, read the short story. You've read the introduction, cultural and historical background for the yellow wallpaper, which walks you through some of the things that we talked about in the last lecture in terms of some of the social issues and movements that were contemporaneous with the story. Um, you also read the chronology of Gilman's life and time, so you were able to see her writings and some of the major events in her life placed within a timeline alongside other significant uh, historical and cultural events that happened in the U.S. Uh, you also read the excerpt from Susan Powers' The Ugly Girl Papers, um, a fascinating <laughs> uh, look at what I described in the previous lecture as what we sometimes see as top 10 beauty tips or something like that on a magazine cover when we're standing in line at the supermarket. Um, and Susan Power has sort of an extended essay, of which we read only 16 pages, um, recommending particular kinds of routines and regimens and behaviors for women. Then you read the section on invalid women, um, as well as the excerpt from S. Ware Mitchell's The Evolution of the Rest Treatment. So having uh, all of that context in your mind and having the story in your mind, the primary purpose of this lecture is to help you figure out how do I put those two kinds of readings together? I've read this piece of fiction, I've read all this contextual stuff, I have all this historical background. How do I apply some of that context or some of that background to understanding the story? What would it look like to do a literary analysis that makes use of all of this information that I have? So I'm going to be modeling that process for you a little bit. Um, I'll be discussing selected passages from the yellow wallpaper, and I've only selected two sections uh, for this lecture since I get into them in, in a lot of detail and that is a way to get a sense of you know how, how you're bringing those two kinds of readings together. So basically this is going to be a preliminary introduction to close reading. Close reading as a method in literary studies is introduced more fully in the next lecture. In the next lecture you have the full this is what close reading is, this is why people in English do it, uh, this, these are the characteristics of a close reading, here's an example of a close reading that doesn't work, here's the feedback that somebody would get on it, here's an example of a revised close reading that does work, and then it'll walk you through the two close reading assignments that you have, which are quite short, uh, that you'll be doing on discussion board four and five to just try your hand at that form of analysis. So this lecture is kind of a companion to the next one, where I'm introducing some of the skills you'll be practicing with close reading, but in the next lecture you'll actually see kind of the nuts and bolts of what close reading looks like. So we have already covered a great deal of context. We've already covered some course terms that are relevant to the yellow wallpaper. For example, in the last lecture, we talked about the patriarchal medical establishment, the way in which physicians were primarily men. And this had a lot to do with um, the higher education institutions that women were allowed into. Uh, for a long time, women were not allowed to conduct any kind of medical study. And if they were allowed, they were not allowed to actually get a degree. That started to change you did start to have a movement for women doctors uh, in the late 19th century and in particular this this was something that was enabled by the fact that um, the United States and Britain um, 
sent women elsewhere to other parts of the world, for example, in Britain to colonies uh, to treat uh, colonized people, uh, especially women. And so, you know, there's this need for women doctors, etc. So there's a whole set of historical things uh, that led to uh, it being more widely accepted for women to become uh, physicians. But at the time that we're talking about, physicians were still predominantly men. And not only were the people who were actually practicing predominantly men, but the entire logic behind certain types of conditions was from the perspective that femininity that did not adhere to the social norms of femininity was suspect, was medically, psychologically suspect. And that's where you have terms like hysteria, which we talked about last time, uh, which sometimes was used as a sort of catch-all term to try to diagnose things that in many ways were indications of a woman trying to transgress uh, or get out of particular social expectations, and this manifested in various ways through behavior and through physical conditions. We also talked about the separation of spheres. We've been over that a lot, the public and private sphere, uh, the public sphere being the world of men, the world of commerce, the, the world of kind of public exchange of ideas, politics, military, that sort of thing, and the private sphere being the domestic sphere of the home, uh, which was rel which, uh, to which women were relegated. So you're already familiar with these terms, so I've brought these terms and all of the, the context associated with them to bear on uh, a couple of passages here. So the first passage, uh, if you turn to page 41 in Bauer, that way you can look and see if you happen to write any notes on that page when you were annotating the text, uh, which might assist you as we're looking at them again here in terms of why they're important. Uh, so the text reads, if a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? My brother is also a physician, and also of high standing, and he says the same thing. So that's from pages 41 to 42. And as you've turned the page to 42, as we were reading that quotation, you'll see that not far beneath where we just left off at the top of the page, there's another quotation I have on the slide here. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. And you have the page 42 citation there. Um, so you've got two very interesting passages. Let's say, you know, I was reading the short story. I happened to put a little star by each of these because I thought they were significant. And I thought they were significant because there was something about, you know, maybe the, the context or maybe something about the way those passages were read. or uh, m Sorry, maybe something about the way I was reading those passages that struck me in terms of the way they were written, etc. So I've picked out these two passages and I've got some course terms that I think are relevant, what do I do next? Because right? it's not enough uh, in an analysis for this class to simply say, here's this passage from pages 41 to 42, and clearly you can see here an example of the patriarchal medical establishment, period. That's not enough. You've got to actually analyze the passage and say a little bit more about it in relation to something like the patriarchal medical establishment. How do you do that? Um, let's talk about that on the next slide. So you can see here I've reproduced the quotation from pages 41 to 42 at the top of the page. This is exactly what we read before. And then underneath that passage, I have a set of bullet points. And each bullet point quotes a small part of the passage. So the passage has been broken down into specific words and phrases. And next to each of those specific words and phrases, there's an interpretation that goes into the deeper meaning of that quotation. So the first bullet point takes out physician of high standing and kind of digs deeper into what does that mean? Why is that significant? So physician of high standing denotes high social status and authority regarding medical expertise. The occupation of physician also denotes not only training but the ability to enter into a field that privileged men. So physician of high standing doesn't just mean John was a doctor that people respected, it also means that he was granted a great deal of authority in society because of his medical expertise and thus um, was part of a larger sort of privileged group of people in the medical establishment who are primarily male. So I'm connecting John and the description of John to the larger notion of patriarchy and kind of the, the patriarchal order in which he is placed. Next bullet point, one's own husband. 
Ah, just like the physician role, this one has a high level of authority too, but here it's not just authority in the public sphere in terms of the job of being a physician, but authority in the domestic sphere. Um, so the husband is regarded as superior and dominant over his wife, and we know that because of the separation of spheres kind of framework. We know that because of the social norms during this period. So if he has this authority as a husband and as a physician, what we've derived so far is he has this double authority from physician and husband, uh, with society on his side in each case. In each case, the social norms say, yes, the physician has authority, yes, the husband has an authority, and in each case, these would be roles for men. You can also see, and we can kind of start um, interpreting this as if he has double authority in society based on these two roles, the narrator is also doubly vulnerable to that authority because he is, she is the object of this physician's care. She is the object of this husband's attention. Um, so she is sort of doubly dominated also because of those two roles uh, that John plays. So we've already gotten a lot here out of just a few words. Going to the next bullet point, I'm on the third bullet point now, assures friends and relatives. This is something that John is doing. So not only does he have authority in the broader public sphere and then over his wife, but in the broader family circle. And that's due to the medical role that he has and the husband role he has. Even those who are the intimates of the narrator, friends and relatives, those are people who are supposed to be close to her, right? Even they are not immune to his authority and control over her. He, he has the authority in that circle as well. Um, so you can kind of see how isolated the narrator is in this sense, where her husband is the one who has so much power and so much influence and respect, and he has made a judgment about her and has pronounced that judgment within all the spheres in which he has influence and authority. So you can kind of see the power dynamic going on here. So what does he say within these circles? He says there's nothing really the matter. Um, so that diminishes her condition and experience to those closest to her. So he's not just saying that to her. He's not just saying that, you know, in his doctor's records. He's saying to fa friends and relatives, there's nothing really the matter here. Temporary nervous depression. This minimizes a serious condition, postpartum depression, uh, to those who could offer most offer her support, making her unknown to them. In other words, this is something that she's experiencing. She's just had a baby and they have no idea what's going on with her. They have no idea what she, what condition she's in, even though they're supposed to be the closest people to her besides her husband. Um, I do want to say that temporary nervous depression by itself as a phrase may not immediately suggest that John is minimizing a serious condition, but coupled with really nothing the matter, you can see how it is. So those two are kind of working together. Um, and we are realizing even more the nature of the isolation. He's not just isolating her in the sense that, you know, he said, well, you know, she's sick and, and you know, that, that stuff's going on. Um, but also, they don't know how serious the illness is. Um, and those are the people who might most be able to support her. Next bullet point, a slight hysterical tendency. This is really interesting because you've got not just word choice going on here, but you've got punctuation, those dashes on either side. Um, so here, you might interpret it as the use of the dashes literally isolate her condition from the rest of the sentence. A slight hysterical tendency is set off on its own, those dashes isolating it. And thus, symbolically, it's isolating her from, on the one side, her diagnosis. If you look on one side of the sentence, you've got temporary nervous depression, so that's on one side. And the other side, from her personal autonomy. When she says, what is one to do? She's asking, what could I do? So you've got the official diagnosis that has so much weight from the male figure ha who has authority, uh, double authority, patriarchal authority over her as physician and husband, and his diagnosis on one side of this hysteria label. And on the other side, you've got her personal autonomy. What could she do? What is her possibility? And hysteria is the thing that's sitting in the middle, um, that catch-all term that's used to describe so many things that women might be experiencing um, in ways that can actually punish women for transgressing social norms or not fitting the ideal. So the diagnosis of hysteria literally in this sentence stands in the way of her recuperating through her own personal action. So this, I, I picked this quotation in part because you can see how in addition to doing the words, 
punctuation can sometimes be really significant. And if you see something that strikes your eye, but you're not sure why, you're just like, well, why'd she, why'd she write it that way? It helps to kind of think about, okay, what's it surrounded by? What's this passage surrounded by? What's the context? And you, not always, but you might develop a very interesting reading uh, of the punctuation. And then you've got what is one to do. Um, so she's made entirely dependent on her husband, who is also her doctor. The repetition of this question, what is one to do, what is one to do, throughout the story, suggests that this powerlessness is profound and also stresses how great John's control is. The what is one to do also, who is she asking that question to? As readers, we're kind of called to try to figure that out. We're kind of called to say, well, what could she do? Uh, and, and to think through that which forces us, because we are being asked a question, forces us to confront the myriad sort of forces of oppression or, or um, the, the various things that are exerting their domination over her socially. We're forced to confront those and say, how is she supposed to resist those things? How is she supposed to fight back against those things? So be, by being asked that question, we are forced to recognize how uh, how dominating and how oppressive her circumstances actually are. You saw in the last slide how we broke down specific words and phrases in a given quotation and really unpacked them. We brought the historical and social context to bear on our reading and we also used some of those course terms as a way to think about some of those specific words and phrases. You remember a couple of slides ago I had two quotations listed, one of which we just talked about and the other which appears at the top of this slide. So I'll go ahead and reread the quotation and this is the narrator speaking. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. This is on page 42. So if we were to do a close reading of this, we would take it on in the same way that we did the last one. So we would break up the quotation into specific words and phrases that strike us as readers and try to unpack uh, the, the deeper meaning of them. In this case, you can see just from the way the quote is laid out that you've got personally I, personally I, and this comes pretty soon after we had the previous quote about what John says, what John tells their relatives and friends, what he says as a physician, what he says as a husband. It's all John says uh, in terms of his authority. We talked about it as a double authority. Here you've got the narrator speaking back, although she's not actually speaking. So the repetition of personally I, followed by disagree and believe, despite the extreme powerlessness she feels, she still has not given up on affirming her own ideas, if only privately to the reader. And then you have their ideas that she disagrees with, versus congenial work with excitement and change. So here you have a contrast in the two approaches to her condition, one which seems distant and imposed, the word there makes it sort of a, you know, external to herself. It's not our ideas, it's their ideas. And we know what those ideas are. They're the ideas of the physician, the ideas of the doctor, the ideas of the husband versus congenial work. The word congenial is very agreeable. Um, excitement and change are very appealing. So you have their ideas, which seems distant and imposed, and then the other, which sounds appealing and healthful. So here you can see how in the, the narrator's discussion of her own experience, she feels alienated by the patriarchal medical establishment that is treating her, represented primarily by John, um, and she, she's more attracted to what she feels instinctively would actually be better for her. Then you have, I believe, would do me good. Uh, that kind of wording shows that she's not allowed to pursue what she feels is best for herself. She's put in a position of subservience and dependence because she's unable to act on her own conviction here uh, and is subject to the power of others. Let's try another quotation. I walked you through how to do a close reading or brainstorm a close reading of a couple other quotations. Let's just brainstorm uh, a little bit more. And I'm not showing you how to actually write a close reading, so after these brainstorming steps that we do where we have all the bullet points and just try to throw out all the deeper meaning, after that you would actually have some more steps to actually write a close reading. So we're just doing some of the preliminary brainstorming now. So a different, a different uh, passage appears on page 44. 
So this is um, John's discussion with the narrator about possibly changing the wallpaper, and John intends to, but then he changes his mind and says he won't. So, quote, he said that after the wallpaper was changed, it would be the heavy bedstead, and then the barred windows, and then that gate at the head of the stairs, and so on. You know the place is doing you good, he said. Um, so some of the terms that immediately came to mind uh, when I read this passage were patriarchal med medical establishment and also oppression. Um, and I'll unpack a little bit uh, as an example on the next slide how we can analyze this quotation through close reading and unpack some of the deeper meaning to see the connections between the quotation and those terms. So first, the first bullet point is just giving a little bit of context for the passage. John is explaining to the narrator that even though he had initially intended to put up new wallpaper, now he isn't going to because he thinks his wife was letting it affect her too much. So it's almost done kind of to spite her in a sense, like, oh, you're letting this get to you, so I'm just going to keep subjecting you to it. Um, so there's that sort of a dynamic, <coughs> dynamic going on in which he is still uh, maintaining a lot of this power. So let's look at some of the actual wording. You've got he said, and you've got he said twice in this quotation. Um, it's repeated twice, but his words have such authority over her entire living situation. So he said just means that he's speaking, but his, spe his speech, what, whatever he says, basically determines the entire scope of her life, her experience, what space she can be in. He can change his mind at will, and she has to live with the consequences in terms of being locked in a room day after day. And you might notice this throughout the story. There is a lot of that, just the he said, he thinks, um, kind of framing everything, which contrasts a great deal from what she's actually experiencing uh, without speaking. She does try to speak a couple of times, and John has a very specific kind of reaction to her when she tries to raise her concerns. The next bullet point, I'm on the third bullet point now, um, after the wallpaper to the heavy bedstead, beds, sorry, bedstead, and then etc. Um, the listing of four things followed by and so on. So you have the bedstead, the barred windows, the gate at the end of the stairs. Those come after the wallpaper, and then you have and so on. Makes it appear that the narrator is going to be excessively and unreasonably demanding. So John is saying this, right? He's like, first you want me to change the wallpaper. Next you'll be asking me to change the bed. After that, you're going to start, you know, clamoring about the barred windows, and then the next thing you're going to do is tell me the gate at the stairs, and so on. So he's he's trying to express in the quotation that um, she is making a, an unreasonable and onerous request of him to change the wallpaper. So that list format is what makes it seem like uh, she's going to be excessively and unreasonably demanding, and he wants to stop this before it starts. But if you look carefully at each item in the list, the things she would want involve not being in a prison-like atmosphere. In other words, getting to live as a free and independent human being. So she's not saying, you know, I want to go out and, and you know, go on a shopping spree or, or something like that that is excessive. She's saying, I kind of want to be let out of this room. Um, so thus he sees her living as a free and independent human being as an excessive demand. I mean, he's framing getting rid of the bars and the gate and all of those things that are closing her in. He's framing that as excessive if, if she asks for those to be removed. Heavy bedstead, now we're looking even more specifically at, at items in the quotation, indicates immovable furniture, perhaps similar to a prison. Uh, barred windows indicate the same prison-like atmosphere, literally keeping her trapped into the domestic sphere, and also resembling an animal's cage. So you can think about the sort of dehumanization that is symbolized there by those barred windows. Also, barred windows could be justified as protection from outside dangers, but really they're trapping or restricting her. And you might remember that term patriarchal benevolence we talked about, where patriarchy, patriarchal control is exerted upon somebody else, but justified by saying, it's for your own good. And the barred windows represent that kind of patriarchal benevolence. The gate at the head of the stairs also indicates a prison-like atmosphere. She's trapped even she gets out of the room. And then, and so on. The and so on says so much here because it seems overwhelming. The bed's nailed to the floor. The windows are barred. If she gets out of the room, there's a gate at the top of the stairs. I mean, this is pretty hard to wriggle out of. But and so on means that there's more. There are even more barriers, more limitations to her that aren't even being said. Um, so this kind of shows how many barriers she would have to overcome that we can't even see. And also, 
John is saying this. He's saying, you'd ask me to change this, change this, change this, and so on. So he thinks that she's going to make you know, a, a long, long, long list of demands that he's not able uh, to deal with. So you can see how we've broken down this quotation and really unpacked why it is that John's refusal to change the wallpaper actually signifies a larger kind of imprisoning that, that he's doing uh, to his wife and a kind of oppression that he's exerting on her using the house specifically, using the domestic sphere that social norms you know, uh, kind of relegate her to, using that um, as a way to exert his control over her. And we developed that point through this close reading by examining all the specific words and phrases. So what we've done uh, in this lecture is I've showed you how to deeply analyze a specific quotation that you might pick out because you think that it resonates especially significantly with context or with some of the course terms. Um, and I showed you how do you break down a quotation. The next lecture will actually go through the entire process, not just of how you break down a quotation, but how you translate that into a written literary analysis and a coherent paragraph, which is where we're heading next. Uh, that's going to be the next uh, couple of assignments for you. If you have any questions about the process that I just demonstrated in terms of how to break down a quotation uh, into its deeper meaning, please don't hesitate to contact me. You can contact me during office hours uh, or uh, we can can make an appointment uh, and you can reach me in various ways in person or uh, remotely via Blackboard or, or other things that you might be comfortable with, you can also email me. Thank you and I look forward to getting into close reading in the next lecture.